include anything that we're doing today, though, okay? All right, let's take a look at these answers. Do you guys agree with their answers? I haven't yet really had a chance to look at them, but I think, uh, I think they all look good to me, okay? So we're going to discuss function properties today, and the first thing we're going to mention on the sheet, the note sheet, I already handed you a note sheet, is domain range. And so um, I thought, hey, let's make that the warm-up, because I think you already know how to do that, so uh, make a good warm-up. Um, do you have any other comments about that before we make it go away? You guys agree with all these answers? There are other ways to write these. You guys all chose to use interval notation, which I think is great. Um, it would have been fine though if you had used interval notation, excuse me, um, uh, inequality notation, or if you, like even for all reals down here, uh, you know, you could write just the all real symbol, or you could write all words, all real numbers would be fine. And there are lots of correct ways to express this information. So I have this like, little story to tell you. I, I was on a, a date with my wife, and, um, and yeah, right? And we went to this little theater, real cute, kind of indie films uh, kind of place, real fun fun little theater, uh, and and the placard out front said this, and I just had to, this is last year, it's only a year ago, and I, I had to take a picture of this and put it in our PowerPoint, because I thought this was so remarkable that it would be, it would say a unit, now, I don't know what this film is, this is not the one we saw, but but it must have been like a huge hit, I, I'm sure it was really a good film, I don't, I don't know, but this is exactly the name of our unit, and I thought I had to, I had to include it in our PowerPoint, you know, and, and take a picture and put it in. Isn't that amazing? It's just, it's just, it's amazing. Okay. Okay. So I've given you, I don't normally, oh, sorry, I was going to say something else about the, the unit. So I, at the beginning of each unit, we'll give you a sheet like this. I've given you a green sheet today, but it could be another color. Um, and on the front, it kind of tells you what kind of things will be in the unit. Um, and then on the back, it gives you the homework assignments from the book. So feel free to see that there. And that's what we mean by homework one. Each night, I'll write up at the top there one or two in a circle or whatever. Um, and you'll do the book assignment. And again, let me just emphasize, you do not ever need to have the book in class. So wherever you do your homework, keep your book there. And, uh, and you'll, just, you'll be able to refer to it. And then at the bottom, too, are listed three important dates. So that's the, the, the dates, at least the tentatively planned dates for your uh, quiz, IV problem, and test. Okay, so make sure those get on your calendar. Always subject to change, though. Subject to change. Okay. So we'll open this here with like a, a unit around properties of functions and graphs of functions and make sure that you have your wheels under you as far as your legs under you as far as that goes. Already we talked about domain range. That's the first thing in the sheet. The next thing, this isn't very satisfying, but here's our definition right now, at least the continuity. Um, you should like hunger as a mathematician for a, a deeper, more precise definition than this. So uh, make that your own exploration if you like. Uh, or you can just wait and we'll tell you what kind of But you should think about like what, what would it take for a function to truly be continuous? What does that mean? Um, it doesn't have to look like this necessarily. It could look like, I, I actually I should change my picture here, because it could also look like this. Right? It, it doesn't have to be smooth necessarily. It could have like sharp corners too. The point being though, that can you draw it with one stroke of a pen is how I guess we'll say it for now. Good. These are, again, I won't always provide a note sheet, for, but to, for today I think it's useful because these are just the definitions like straight from the book. I don't, I don't see a like educational purpose in just like copying them down. I mean, if you like, you can handwrite them all later, and if that helps you, whatever. But um, plus, I think some of these things you know. We just need to talk about the technicalities, right? Like, I think you know about types of discontinuities. Um, these are often this first kind I'm highlighting here is often called a removable discontinuity. You might have called it a hole before too. That's a fine way to say it also. Um, it could look like this in the first diagram. It could also look like this in the second diagram, where it's been like redefined that one point, right? So I know that might seem a little strange to you, but it certainly qualifies as a function, right? This is a function. It does pass the vertical line test if that's if that's your test. Every x value there is only one y value. Um, you could have a jump discontinuity, or you could have an infinite discontinuity. Those are the three categories we might put things in. 
Um, oh yeah, I was going to say about removable. A removable discontinuity is interesting, right, because if you were just to redefine one value of the function, then it would be fixed, right? And you would have, it would be continuous again. Whereas in these other two cases below, like, it would take a lot more than just redefining one y value to fix the continuity issue. Yeah. So nothing to say there unless you have something to say. Yeah. Just throwing this out there here. Uh, there are some that are new. Like even here, I know you know what a horizontal and vertical asymptote uh, is, but let's introduce some more technical language. And I apologize, yeah, this is out of order. This is actually on the back. I don't know. I should reorder it maybe. So it is there though, I promise. So this is the language right here, this notation. Let's emphasize that, this, this piece, because I think you definitely, from an intuitive standpoint, know what a horizontal asymptote is. But I want to make sure you're comfortable with this notation as well, because I think it's, for some of you at least, for many of you, most of you, this is the first time you've probably ever seen this notation. So the way you read this out loud is, the limit as x approaches infinity, the positive infinity, of f of x equals b. So I'll say it again. The limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x equals b. You've communicated that information using like arrows before. I know you, you have a way of writing that that you might have used in other courses. But, but this is the way I think you should get used to writing it and seeing it. If you're moving toward calculus, this is the way it will almost always be written. Uh, or over here, too, right? And a horizontal asymptote, um, we're asking, what happens when x gets large? Isn't that what we're asking about? Or when x gets really negatively large? What happens? Isn't that what we really mean by hard asymptote? Does, as x get large, does y tend toward some number? If so, we can write this and we say the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals 5 or something. If that's what the y equals 5 is the hard asymptote then. Now notice also in the middle there is the word or. So both don't have to hold. If either one holds, then we have a horizontal asymptote. Yeah. Um, I thought you were saying it was an arrow because like, if the horizontal asymptote is zero, um, then y is not going to like get to zero. Yeah, exactly. It's just gonna tend yeah, the equal it. the equals doesn't belong to f of x. It's not like f of x will ever be b. We're asking. This is like this is like a. Oh, the limit. Yeah, it's the limit of f of x equals b. But you're right, absolutely. Uh, it's not necessarily true that f will ever take on that value. It could, but it won't necessarily. OK. Um, or, though, is, is key. So give an example of a function that has uh, exhibits asymptotic behavior on both sides. Like what's a function you already know that? Yeah. Say one more time. Oh, that's okay. That's, that's fine. I was going to ask for that too. The ne next is give an example of a function that exhibits asymptotic behavior only on one side, and an, as and an exponential function would be an example of that. So, what's one that would exhibit yeah, uh, asymptotic behavior on both sides? Do an example. Yeah, 1 over x would be my go to example as well. So, you know that the or is important there. It could be either one, it doesn't have to be both. Okay. Uh, vertical asymptote, we're going to introduce the same kind of notation to describe that, just to practice the notation here. I know you know intuitively what a vertical asymptote is, but the way we read this out loud, this is like this little negative in this plus here. What does that mean? It's up in kind of the exponent location. It's not an exponent, though. We read this as the limit as x approaches a from the left, or from like the negative side, of f of x equals infinity, or, or possibly negative infinity. So what that means is, as we approach, say, x equals 2 is what you claim is the asymptote, the vertical asymptote, x equals 2. As we approach from the left side, we require that as x gets very close to 2 on the left, that is values like 1.999 or something, that the value of y is tending toward infinity or possibly negative infinity, right? And again, this is an or. If, if on the right that happens, on either the left or the right, we call that a vertical asymptote. And actually, I think on this one, it might be hard for you to think of, off the top of your head, an example of, well, I don't know, maybe you, maybe you remember that around for two. Can you think of an example of a function that has an asymptote only on one side, a vertical asymptote exhibited only on one side? Yeah, maybe a logarithmic function, right? Yeah. So, so if either one holds, then we call it a vertical asymptote. End behavior is an intimately thi a, a thing that's intimately related to this thing up here, the horizontal asymptote. Um, we, we might talk about the right end behavior or the left end behavior of the function and just know that that's what we mean, right? We mean uh, 
do we get some limit as we go out to positive infinity or negative infinity? Do we get some number, A or B or something? Um, the other answers you could get there beside a number would be like infinity, right? You could get, you could go off to infinity or negative infinity. You could also be like, uh, just we could, we might just say undefined, right? Can you think of a function that doesn't really go off to infinity, but also doesn't go to a single value? Is that possible? What would that be? I don't know. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, something sinusoidal maybe would be a good example. It's not the only example, perhaps. The other thing that could happen, too, is that it maybe doesn't go to infinity at all, right? Like maybe it doesn't even exist to infinity. We just talked about the logarithmic function. What's the left end behavior of the log function? You know, there really isn't any. You can't approach negative infinity. It's not allowed. Uh, or the square root function, for example. What's the left end behavior of the square root function? That's not a good, you're just not allowed to ask the question, sorry. Right, like there is no answer to this question. The limit as x approaches negative infinity, <laughs> stop there, like it doesn't. <laughs> we don't even, can't even talk about it in certain cases. Right? So go ahead and talk to your group about this, these two problems. Practice, again, I know you know how to answer these. I think you do. But practice using that notation, actually, like actually yourself writing that out. And then as x goes to, so give me two statements on both of these pictures, assuming the behavior I've tried to indicate is what I'm trying to indicate. Write out two statements for each one so about the left and the right end behavior. And then check to see that the person who's next to you wrote the same thing. Tell me out loud um, the answer to the first one. Or do you need another second to look through these? Okay, okay. You can discuss for another second. All right, uh, Allie, where are you? You're Allie. Okay, what's the... Uh, Give me both fill in the blanks for A. Um, negative. They're both negative infinity? Yeah. Okay. Agree? Yeah. Alexis, where are you? I said infinity and zero. Agree? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I heard like some hesitation on this one from some, some folks out here. Um, just know that as long as, as x tends toward negative infinity, y tends toward zero, then that is the definition of a horizontal asymptote. May it cross the horizontal asymptote? A absolutely. Was that part of the definition? No, it didn't say that it couldn't take on that value at some point. But certainly functions, there are lots of functions that cross their own horizontal asymptotes. So that's not a problem at all. Okay. Um, okay. All right.
increasing and decreasing, I think is something you've thought about before. The one, um, or constant, it could be too, right? There's some pictures. Uh, the one like piece of the, of, of the discussion that's kind of somewhat weird is um, like here, we're using the following definition. So we'll work with this definition. I think I, I, think I really did steal this directly from the book, so we'll go with it. Um, it says that a positive change in x, if we're talking about something that's increasing, we're talking about having, if a po you have a positive change in x, then that yields a positive change in y, right? For any two x values you pick on an interval where you claim it's increasing, that should be true. I should be able to pick two points in your interval and have that be true. A positive change in x results in a positive change in y over, that, over those two points. Uh, so that might seem uncontroversial to you, but the reason I bring it up is because what about a graph of a function like this? Um, like if you have a function that looks something like that, would you say that that's an increasing function? Well, I mean, I think I would. I, I think I'd be okay with that. But technically on this definition, that isn't increasing because you can pick two points here, where it, here and here, say, where a positive change in and x doesn't result in a positive change for y. It, it, it results in a, in a, a change of zero, right? That's not positive. So, but I would probably, uh, the right way I would, I would differentiate between those maybe, as I would call this increasing, but not strictly increasing is the word I would use. I would say it's, so, but whatever, I don't know. According to this definition though, this is kind of strict increasing or strict decreasing. So we'll go with this definition. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I really do think that's the, the, the language from the book. Yeah, it's not the be all and end all though. I mean, people came up with these definitions, so they only serve us to some extent, whatever that extent might be. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to say about increasing decrease? I just wanted to highlight that like weird point. Okay. So, uh, using this understanding of that, then practice just again the notation, the idea of increasing decreasing. Can you write down? The increasing and decreasing intervals for these two graphs. I'll help you out by drawing the word glasses, and maybe this isn't maybe clear. So at x equals plus and minus two.
Um, good. Let's get uh, Danielle and Bianca. If you guys have put up your answers, here, that'd be great. Sorry, Daniel and Bianca. So the um, so the debate I heard a on a couple tables here was do you do you include zero or not on that first one? What do you, I mean? What would you say? You can put on the second one. You included it. So do you want to defend your your case? So uh, if you use the definition, if you include zero as a point, then you'd have to use another point, and anything after that is increasing. So yeah. So it works with the definition. So I think that's okay. I guess. But then zero is in both is both a place where it's increasing or decreasing. I guess that's okay. I mean, what is happening at zero? Notice in our definition uh, that we didn't talk about what it means to increase or decrease even at decrease at a point, right? Because that wasn't part of the definition. It was like on an interval. It was defined for intervals, right? So you're welcome to have it be open, though. I mean, you'd still be right if it was open. Like it's certainly true that for every two points in that interval, it would be increasing or, or decreasing. Depending. Uh, and then Bianca has done a nice job here, I think. Um, uh, you, you know, the temptation would be to maybe combine these two intervals or something. Um, just notice, though, that, like, if you have two points, if you pick two points, it should always be true. Like, if someone claims that from negative infinity to zero it's increasing, then you could demonstrate with it for, for two points that have a positive change in x, there isn't a positive change in y. So that wouldn't work. Like, you really do have to split it up, don't you? Plus, it's not defined at There's that. Um, so I don't have too much more to say about that. But do you, do you like that? Again, hopefully this is a good review of things. Uh, and we're, hopefully our conversation is focusing on the finer points, the notation, the details, the definitions. Um, this one might be brand new to you, though, this idea of boundedness. Um, so a function is called bounded below. We'll start with this one. We'll read what it says. If there is some number b that is less than or equal to every number in the range of f, any such number is called a lower bound. So if you want to visualize a guess, okay. If you want to visualize a lower bound, uh, draw a horizontal line. If you can draw a horizontal line, uh, Underneath the function, that like the function never goes down below, then it's bounded. The function must be bounded below, right? Because if it wasn't, if if, if you kept trying, and eventually your function does cross your line, and you're like, oh, I need to move it lower, but it still crosses. Well, then that's not a function that's bounded below, right? But if you can draw any horizontal line underneath the function, that the function never crosses, then that that function must be bounded below. Now I've demonstrated with this picture a lower bound. But is, is, is it the maximal lower bound? No, I mean, you could get come up with a tighter lower bound, couldn't you? Right there, or something. Right, that would be called the greatest lower bound, maybe, if you, if you wanted to come up with it. But there's not, both, mine demonstrates that, that this is bounded below too, though, down here, right? Of course, the same definition for bounded above, just with a switch on the terms. And if a function is both bounded below and above, then it's bounded, it's simply bounded. Notice that this discussion only applies to the range of the function, right? We're only talking about like whether the function that is f or y is what what happens with the outputs of the function. Do they stay within a certain set of finite values? So again, you might go through and think about which functions do I know that fit into those categories. Uh, local and absolute extrema. We should say something about those things. Um, I'll put them all up here because, again, the two definitions are basically the same. Lots of words here that mean the same thing. Like by local maximum, we also sometimes call that a relative maximum. Uh, and actually, an absolute maximum, sometimes we also call like global maximum.
and this is this is the, the piece up for local, we mean on some that there exists some open interval where it's the, lo the lowest or for, uh, sorry the highest. And for local minimum, there exists any open interval around it. If you can find an open interval where it's the minimum, then it's a local minimum. It's called a neighborhood is what that's called. So if, there's, if, it's, if it's the lowest in its neighborhood, then it's a local minimum. So what would you call this first point in this picture? Yeah, that's a local minimum because it's the lowest point in some neighborhood containing the point, in some open interval containing the point. Right? No. Yeah, yeah. So if like let's see if we can claim the key is open interval containing the point, right? Because if you try to claim that this is a minimum and no matter how tight you make your interval, it will always contain points that have a y value that are greater than it, won't it? If it's clear if it's an open interval containing that point, it will that point, it'll always have values both less than and greater than here, right? So it's not a local extreme at all. Does that make sense? But if there exists even one interval, that open interval that contains the point where it's the lowest value for y, then it's a local minimum. The second one, what's that? Oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, how do you determine when, like, the, the locality of like? Could be any, any, it doesn't matter. You can, you can pick any interval, big or small. Yeah. As long as it exists. It's not true that every interval containing this point demonstrates its minimumness, right? If you pick a really big interval, it's not the minimum anymore. But as long as there exists one interval, open interval, that contains it, where it's the lowest, then it's a local minimum. So you can make it, you might make it small, right? Uh, what about the second one? Yeah, local max. Yeah. And then the last one is a local min. It's also an absolute min. Okay. Certainly, if you're an absolute minimum, you are also definitely a local min, right? Uh, or max, same idea. If I'm, and I, I think I'm the tallest teacher in the school. If I'm the tallest teacher in the school, then I'm definitely, definitely also the tallest teacher in the math department, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, the last thing we need to introduce to you is the notion of, uh, the, of symmetry, odd and even is the language we use, and this should be on there somewhere too, I hope. A function, we, we use the term even, um, I don't think you've come across this word before necessarily. A function is said to be even if this is true algebraically. Visually, though, we're talking about it's got symmetry with respect to the y-axis, right? So that is to say, if you plug in 5 and you plug in negative 5, you get the same y-value, right? That would be the algebra and the geometry on that. And a picture of, this is like kind of a classic picture of y equals x squared maybe or something. But think of some other functions that you know that have that kind of symmetry. Uh, a function is said to be odd if it exhibits this algebraic behavior. Um, visually speaking, what does that mean visually? Well, it means that if the point 5, 3 is on your graph, then we also require, if it truly is odd, that the point negative 5, comma, negative 3 be on your graph, which means it has what kind of symmetry? Here I said symmetry with respect to the origin, but you might not be comfortable with that. What kind of symmetry would you call that? Yeah, what would you say? It's not actually symmetry over y equals x. Yeah, it's rotational around the origin, 180 degree rotational symmetry around the origin. Um, you could also call it like a point reflection, a point reflection, reflections of points through the origin, right? I don't know if you ever thought about that, but, but those are both ways of saying the same thing. Yeah, rotation of 180 degrees, we call that an odd function. Now, is it good enough when we're thinking about this idea to just be like, well, I think this function is odd or even, and because when I graph it, it looks that way. That would be one informal way of maybe thinking that maybe it's even or odd or whatever. But is that a proof? No. How can we prove a function is even or odd? Let's use this as a vehicle for teaching you like how to prove something and justify a claim. Another good way to, to, uh, that you might reach for is to be like, hey, I plugged in four. And I plugged in negative 4, and I got the same result. Is that a proof that it's even? Well, it's certainly one piece of evidence, but you need like an infinite number of other pieces of evidence to, to, to prove the claim. So the way you might prove that this is, and by the way, is this clear? pretty clear to you in your mind that it's even just like on an intuitive level? 
Okay. Some of these I don't have any intuition for after I get to here maybe though, right? Like some of these are like, whoa, I don't know. But this one I think is even just because I think I know what it looks like. Um, the way I might prove it though is to think, okay, well what happens if you plug in negative x? Not just negative 5. In general, what happens just if you plug in negative x? Well, you get 3 times negative x to the fourth plus 5, which is equal to 3x to the fourth plus 5, which is equal to f of x. And what have we just showed? Haven't we just shown that f of negative x equals this, which equals this, which is equal to f of x? And if we're trying to show that that's even, that is exactly what we mean by even. So we're done, right? So what do you think about this one? Do you have any intuition on this one? We'll see what happens. Is this one even? Is it odd? It could also be neither, right? Notice I'm just putting negative t everywhere a t is, carefully. Now, what happens when we take negative t to the fifth power? Yeah, we get a we get like five odd cop uh, not odd number of copies of t, so we get negative two to the fifth over negative, and the same kind of thing happens down here too, right? So far, I'm still not like seeing anything. Yeah, maybe I yeah I'm gonna do that. Canceling out a negative in the top and bottom gives us what? What is that? What is that? That's the original function. So actually, this one's even too. Now, I just want to show you both because the first one is pretty clear without your like, why would even need, I need, this seems like a useless waste of time. But over here, this does take a little work to convince you that it's even, doesn't it? Okay. And by the way, feel free to graph it now also and see that, yeah, you'll see also visually that it looks even. It looks like it's got a reflection over the y-axis. It's its own. Um, yeah, what about this one here? Yeah, plug in negative z. The, do you get what do you get what happens here I guess that's all we have time for um, anyone have a hunch on C yeah I don't think it's even either. We'll have to think about whether it's odd or not. I don't know. All right, so homework one, I think you're pretty well prepared to do homework one. Uh, that'll be due on Tuesday, though, so you don't have to do it tonight. You can do it over the weekend. See you tomorrow for a quiz. Bye, everybody. We just Yeah, whatever it says. That, yeah, that's on the. Yeah, exactly.